Welcome to Out of Home Insider, the first podcast for media and marketing executives that connects how offline attention drives conversion. My name is Tim Rowe, and for the past four years, I've been interviewing guests about their unique insights in bridging this misunderstood and undervalued opportunity for brands to create alchemy in the real world. Today's guest is Robert Chen. Robert is the founder of EatMe's, a New York City-based food delivery platform that connects restaurant-fresh ingredients with hungry New Yorkers who love great food but are tired of apps and meal kits. We talk about the importance of curating supply-side partners and understanding the job to be done as a three-sided marketplace in a competitive industry. And Robert challenges us to ask why an opportunity exists, offering perspective on excess value creation, whether or not your position is defensible, and ultimately creating frameworks that scale. So that's the big idea I'd like you to consider during this conversation. Why does the opportunity exist? Whatever that opportunity is that you're in relentless pursuit of, why does the opportunity exist? It could be the key to unlocking unprecedented growth, or it could offer the warning to turn back before getting further down a slippery slope. Whatever it is, explore it, understand it, and continue to evaluate it as you proceed. Without further ado, let's go. Welcome, everybody, to the Out of Home Insider Show, a podcast like no other, hosted by the one and only Tim Rowe. Get ready to have some knowledge dropped on you and to be entertained because nothing's more valuable than food for your brain. So sit back, relax, we're about to dive in as the best industry podcast is about to begin. Meal kits can be expensive uh, and frankly, they can take even more time to prep and cook than if you just went out to eat. And ordering from an app has gotten really, really expensive. So it, it might be faster. Uh, than if you went to have a sit down meal, like what gives? Where where where's the balance? And that's yeah. what we're going to talk about here today with Eat My CEO Robert Chen. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Tim. Appreciate you having me. Absolutely. So for folks that might not know Eat My's yet, give them the, like the sixty second commercial. Sure, sure. So um, we're a food delivery platform in New York City, um, and we partner with some of the top restaurants in, in New York um, City, like. You know, Luke's Lobster, Ivan Ramen, Bear Burger, Obao. And what we do is we bring prepped, ready to cook ingredients from their best dishes directly to your door so that you can cook them at home in under 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so one way to think about it is last mile of cooking. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that uh, I realize, and I think a lot of our customers realize is, at least in New York, there's kind of two sides of the spectrum in terms of eating at home. It's um, you know, ordering, as you mentioned, DoorDash or Uber Eats, right? right? Which, as we all know, can be very expensive. It doesn't it always- It was affordable. It seemed like it was right. affordable for a while. Yeah. And there's some fundamental kind of logistical challenges that I think that they face. And there's a new legislation in New York that's going to cause uh, kind of prices to go up even more. But anyway, so that's kind of one side of the spectrum. And, you know, there's okay. issues with delivery, soggy delivery, and, and sure. not everything travels well, right? Um, then the other side of the spectrum is, you know, cooking from scratch where at a very simple basis, you go to the grocery store, you go through the whole kind of uh, process of buying groceries, figuring out what to eat, cooking, prepping it, cooking it. And there's a lot of ingredient wastage sometimes as well. Um, and then meal kits try to solve that. Uh, you alluded to it, but when they mm -hmm. say it takes 30 minutes to cook, it really takes like an hour to cook, right? Oh, and, it takes even longer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. And, um, and, 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 you know, it's like limited cuisine types of being shipped from a warehouse. So, where we fit in, uh, just kind of thinking about those both sides is compared to, you know, delivery, we're selling at, call it the exact same dish, 30 to 50% okay. cheaper, right? And then the if I went to the restaurant or ordered it on an app. Exactly. If you go on DoorDash, same exact dish, we're going to okay. sell it for 30 to 50% cheaper. And the reason is because we've set up a logistical model that I think benefits the ecosystem and we can pass those savings on to the consumer. Um, and also you're cooking kind of fresh ingredients from the kitchen, right? So you never have that soggy. It's always very fresh and very, you know, a lot of people say it's better than going to the restaurant or, you know, ordering delivery. So, um, and on the other side, kind of the cooking from scratch side, because the restaurant's already prepped everything for you, you're just doing the last 10 minutes of the fun parts of cooking. So we've essentially outsourced the annoying parts. Yeah. 
right? And so <laughs> make you the hero. Just let me yeah, plate the dish and, and yeah. impress my friends. That's really exactly. all I'm trying to do. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So the yeah. idea here is I'm getting the ingredients, like like I'm getting essentially meal prep directly from the restaurant for dishes that I'm familiar with or yeah. wanted to try. So it's it's that at home cooking experience with the obviously the savings of you know ordering ahead and, and, and taking advantage of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Were you working like in the food industry before? Like, how did this idea come to be? Right. Obviously, there's enough meal kits and, and enough groceries, uh, you know, yeah. to, to buy. So how would you how did you find Great this question. in between space? Um, to answer your question, I've never worked in food, actually. I okay. um, most of my career. So I've been in New York for almost 20 years now. I went to college here as well. Um, and after most of my career was in finance. So investing at various funds. Um, and I think through that over a kind of a decade of experience, I very much kind of just understanding businesses, logistics, margins, profitability, the economy, and, and it really helped me understand what makes industries and businesses mm. work versus not work. Um, and then during the pandemic, you know, I think everyone had this kind of like, what's going on? What's, you know, what's the meaning of life moment? And I definitely had that. And um, I think there was two angles for me why I went in this route is uh, one is restaurants were really suffering during the pandemic, right? I think, right. Um, and there are a lot of short-term solutions, right? Like, um, you know, PPP loans and everyone had all these ideas. And I, I think just putting on my business hat, I was like, there's got to be some longer sustainable solution here. Because um, even before the pandemic, they've always suffered with thin margin profiles, right? And I was thinking, okay, how do we help them access a huge addressable market without really increasing their costs? So that's kind of mm. what led to this idea. Um, so that's kind of one side. And the second side is just on a personal basis. I've always really wanted to start a company. And I think the pandemic really pushed me to do that. And I felt like with the pandemic, it was kind of perfect time, right? Because long-term consumer changes and um, and things like that. So never worked in food, but kind of uh, went the, pivoted this way, but I couldn't be more grateful. <laughs> uh, makes sense. And it's, it's it makes sense when we look back, right? It, it it can rarely make sense when we look ahead. We think yeah. we have these plans. We we just kind of shoot towards it and see where see where things end. But maybe come back to that for a second. This is a broad global audience. You've got a lot of folks on the kind of sell side of media, media companies, and then a lot of folks on on the buy side as well, brands, agencies, folks like that. Mm -hmm. For those for for those listeners what makes business and industry work? What are like kind of, yeah. do you have like three fundamentals, th things that you've seen after observing so many different scenarios? Like yeah. what are those common themes that you've seen? Yeah, I, it's a good question. I think, um, you know, just diving into kind of us as an example, the first thing I wanted to understand is why does this opportunity exist? And mm -hmm. what I mean by that mostly is, again, because I come from a finance and business background is, do, do the margins work here, right? Because, and the reason I say that is because I think what I've seen across a lot of businesses is there's businesses, if you strip a, a kind of apart what they're doing, some truly create value in an ecosystem and some don't. And the ones that create value and the, what I wanted to find out here is how can we actually make it economical for both the restaurant and the customer to succeed? And that's when we dug into the logistics, okay? Let's go into the off peak hours of restaurants between lunch and dinner, where the incremental cost for them is not real estate and labor, which is about 60, 70% of cost. It's just ingredients what? and they have procurement advantages on those ingredients. So if we design it correctly, we can pass those savings on to the customers and there's a large kind of gap for margin. And then the other way is kind of just thinking about delivery costs, right? Through cooking, uh, through delivering ingredients, we can batch our delivery. So our deliveries per hour goes from 1.6, which is what DoorDash and Uber is doing to five plus. So I think logistically, I wanted to first solve that, okay, there's a real math uh, equation that we're solving here that can translate correctly to the customer. And, and, and it's kind of like the way I would describe it is creating more out of less, right? It's taking what's there and creating value out of it. And it's a, I'm sure there's a better way of explaining this, but like, that's kind of a concept that I think is important because um, a lot of companies that I've seen, it's very much a zero sum game, right? Where you're, they're not, not all, but you're not always creating value, but you're just kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul. And when that happens, sustainability and long-term viability of the company is not always there. So 
I would say that's one big thing um, um, that I, I've always kind of dug in. And obviously other things in terms of like, the question was always, okay, what if DoorDash comes in, right? Like, you know, what, what, if, what if, right? So there's a lot of those types of questions. What's your defensive moat um, and things like that. But, um, and also uh, I could talk about this for hours, but the other thing is just like addressable market. We can right? make a multi-part series, yeah, Robert. Exactly. exactly. Um, addressable market, like making sure that the formula you create can be applied to a large scale, right? And so food, restaurants, massive market. So I'll stop Lots there. of people. Lots of people. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's, I mean, it, I, I just wrote these words down. It sounds like monetizing excess value creation, right? Like there's yeah. this, there's inherent value between a restaurant and someone who eats at a restaurant, right? Like that relationship yeah. exists. We don't need you to, to change that or improve that at all. Yeah. But yeah. can we use, can we take advantage of this unused kitchen capacity, right? We've got all these fixed costs that are baked in, but We've got these times of day where the kitchen is slow and, and we have some leverage as a business and that we can buy more tomatoes, buy more, we can buy in bulk yeah. and then increase yeah. our yeah. margins. And it sounds like the big key here as a consumer is that logistics unlock, then being able to take advantage of that at steeply discounted rates. So maybe exactly. double click into that. There's a lot, a lot of, we talked about a global <laughs> audience, but specifically there's a lot of folks yeah. in New York city listening right now. Right, right. How does it work? If I were to order, how does it do I have to order weeks in advance? Is this like something that I need to, to plan out my meals or mm -hmm. how on demand is this? Yeah. So it's, it's one day in advance. So basically if you want it tomorrow, you have to put in your order before midnight tonight. Okay. Um, we're actually shifting to a same day model um, where it's wow. in the morning, but um, so that's, and the reason um, we're doing that is kind of, I would attack it from two angles. Um, um, the first is by setting it up that way. Um, when we have preset routes, we can again, get our delivery costs on a per delivery basis from call it. If you order from Uber or DoorDash, it could literally cost a system that one meal that you get, maybe $11, 12 I mean, I, I'm not trying to rag on it. I've, I, yeah. I used to order off of DoorDash a lot, like just yeah. being a startup guy, right? Working crazy out. It's just easier. Yeah. I have. Now I don't, I have to think before I order because yeah. with the delivery fee, with the tip, it's like, wait, I'm ordering a $20 burrito and I'm paying another $20 to get it brought to my house. Like, yeah. this is yeah. no longer fiscally responsible, Tim. Yeah. Like, just go make a damn sandwich. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's changed my decision-making profile. I live out here in the burbs, so we don't have, right. you know, a lot of stuff too close. But I think that everybody experiences it in their own unique scenario. So yeah. to have yeah. another option that makes so much sense, I like to cook. I like yeah. to cook. Um, so what, what's been the hardest part in building a company like this? There's obviously a lot, right? You're building a two-sided marketplace with yeah. the logistical element. Like there's a yeah. lot of layers, three-sided, yeah. right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's we're getting into like five dimensions here, yeah. right? You're building a lot of the thing, like, getting restaurant one i'm sure was its own big achievement yeah maybe what's what's been that really like that that war story that you tell folks you're oh, like man. oh there was what this time <laughs> there's pictures of me just on a city bike just doing deliveries and that's one of our go-to pictures like hardcore oh. but it's real everything. founder stories yeah yeah i mean it's real and i i that's one of the things that i loved about it i wanted to embrace this and embrace this challenge and and i really believe uh not to diverge too much is like i really believe that to make a business successful as a founder, you have to do everything. Because I want to know what it's like to deliver. So then I know when I hire couriers, when I what the, I know what they go through. I want to sell to the restaurant. So then when I hire a salesperson, I know what they so I, you know, honestly, for the beginning it was just all me. Um wow. and literally designing the recipe cards. You know, I don't know wow. anything about cooking, right? And um <laughs> and I think it was a very humbling experience, but it also gave me the tools to kind of understand how to grow and scale this. Um but to answer your question, man, like the, I mean, the first restaurant that was huge, right? That was a huge milestone, very challenging. Um, and it's very much traditional founder story, like email blasting everyone, running door to door to actual restaurants and just like, hey, I have this idea, you know, like this, I don't even have a prototype, but what do you think? You know? What they think? Like, were they like, this is ridiculous. This I makes mean, no sense. The the. The benefit is like I it was during the pandemic when I think people's ears were perked up. Mm. Like, hey, 
you know, the world's on fire. Like, let me think of ideas. Let me be open to that. Primed, receptive audience. Exactly. Exactly. But having said that, it's like, if you're some random guy just Instagram DMing, like, a, <laughs> you know, it's like, hey, what's up? Like, it's <laughs> pretty hard. Um, I think what I've learned is that you have to sell the vision and you have to find people that believe in the vision. Um, because when you don't really have, you know, it's just a concept, you don't have a prototype or anything, you have to be able to sell it and you're going to find people that understand, give you a chance and, and that don't. Right. Um, so that was, I mean, that, that was a big thing. And I think you alluded to it as a marketplace. How do you get customers without restaurants? How do you get restaurants without customers? You know, it's, uh, <laughs> is so it it's the chicken, uh, is it the egg? I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that was tough, but I think, uh, you know, knock on wood, finally, we kind of got to a place where at least we have a st stable kind of marketplace. So a lot of war stories, a lot of war stories. It's as you were sharing the story on the city bike, I'm reminded of uh, there's a great podcast episode. It's uh, Masters of Scale. Reed Hoffman's interviewing Brian Chesky. Mm. And Brian Chesky from Airbnb talks about that very special time in the beginning as a founder and the opportunity to handcraft your product. Yeah. And 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 it's that and i think it can get so oftentimes overlooked with the infusion of capital and lots of money and yeah. this allure of 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 a being a startup yeah at the I end of the day on. it's about rolling up your sleeves and doing yeah. the work and and then building a product around that experience solving a problem for customers along the way i think if you skip the painful annoying steps you miss out on a lot of the gold right like I mean, even our recipe card, for instance, it's like, again, I don't really cook. Like, I have no idea what works, right? And I think sometimes that naivety, sometimes that ignorance is a blessing and it gives you an advantage because I come in with open eyes and I just kind of like write some recipes. I get feedback. I iterate and kind of, I think it's a little bit more of the process mentality and having that perseverance as opposed to having some pre-existing knowledge that it takes longer, but I think it gets you to the right answer. Outsider is the new insider. That's a, that's a little saying we have around no, here. No. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to hold true. You're in New York now. When you think about scaling, what does what does that look like? What is is it more markets? Is it a wider variety of restaurants, more neighborhoods? What what's next when you yeah. when you think about that next yeah, chapter? Good question. I think I look at it in kind of two phases almost. I think the the next phase is definitely geographical expansion. I think we, you know, I think New York alone, New York City alone is so special in such a massive market. And I think there's a lot that we can do here. And I think once we kind of, you know, scale efficiently here, the idea is to take this formula and go to other cities, obviously, similar to DoorDash or Breeze. And I think just putting on, again, the business and logistics hat, you know, there are tweaks that you have to make for certain markets, but ultimately this formula is scalable for on a nationwide basis, on a kind of a global basis. Um, um, and I think the the other way I would think about it is, I really think there's a dearth for a, a restaurant platform that partners with the restaurants that is trusted as a food brand. And when I mean, hmm. what I mean by that is, you know, DoorDash, Uber Eats, um, a lot of these uh, 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 companies are, they're, they're delivery companies, right? So right. their, their goal is to uh, first restaurants and now they want to deliver everything, grocery, everything, and alcohol, right? Um, and it makes sense because that's their core competency. And I think where we stick out is, we create a more intimate connection with the restaurant and the diner because we're literally taking their dishes. We represent their dishes. We have ingredient level data and, you know, a lot of things that we have where that gives us a lot of different type of platform opportunities. Um, and, you know, a lot of it's called it food related. Like, can we help restaurants create sauces to have CPG into retail partners? You know, like wow. there's a lot of things that I think we can do by being this wow. unique food trusted platform that others, you know, the other incumbents can't. So I think that the way I think about it is they're kind of the delivery vertical. We're attacking the food vertical. Um, yeah. Robert, you said this, this is your first pod. This is the first podcast you've done. Did I get first that right? Podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just excited that we're going to be able to look back at this moment in time and say, remember when, <laughs> remember when, when eat Mize is in every neighborhood around the country and <laughs> the, this audience is indulging in lots of, uh, local treats. It's incredible to to think about that vision and that opportunity. We've seen it, right? I think I, my first job, my first job was as a sandwich engineer at Panera Bread. They didn't call it engineer. I added that. 
<laughs> but but then Panera, you saw they had the salad dressings in retail and and right, and you've seen brands yeah. and Chick-fil-A sauce. You can get it at Target, right? And yeah. But I've never seen a DoorDash or anything at, yeah. in my food aisle. It's and, not their it's not their business, you know, it's their delivery company, right? So right. it doesn't make sense. And I think and I think the big thing is, and not to, you know, talk ourselves too much up is I we found that the type of restaurant, <laughs> the uh, the type of relationship that we have with restaurants are very different. Um, you know, like the the ratio of call it restaurants to account is very different from other things. And what what that um, and because I, as I mentioned, it's a very intimate process where we have to walk through their meals, recipes. That's afforded us kind of more ways to not partner with them, not only on a marketing front where they help us market, they're creative. It's like, hey, maybe we can give a free appetizer to your, you know, you know, there's a lot of things that they work with us on that I think makes me feel like we have all these opportunities that we can help them tackle um, because there's that relationship and trust between us and them. Just reminded me of, I'd like to make an introduction for you after this, some sure. uh, parallel space that I think there's some, some overlap in. Um, Wow. Robert, thank you so much. If folks want to, if folks want to learn more, if they, they're probably starving at this point, <laughs> give them the, we use Latin long to, uh, to, to give folks direction on the real world. Tell, tell, tell the audience where to go, where should they go to learn more about you? Check out the brand. Give them that. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely our website. So eat means.com E A T M I S E, um, dot com. Um, and check it out. And you know, we have dishes on there. Um, you can, check it out. Um, we have a, a subscription that um, I could kind of share more about it very really designed to be kind of the New York lifestyle where very flexible, there's no fees, you know, you cancel a day before and I'm not like the other meal can companies, you can just order one per week. So it's, it's very much, I would say an experience that designed for spoiled New Yorkers, at least at this point where we're so used to convenience and, and, and all that. Um, so great food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously, we're so spoiled. I feel like so, so like, spoiled, so spoiled, so spoiled. So, um, yeah, yeah. Cool. We'll make sure to link to all that. Maybe just touch on that. You, you mentioned subscription. There's a sub. I, I can subscribe to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the way it works is, um, and there's actually a little bit of backstory to this where we realized that people wanted a subscription. They wanted that okay. order reminder. They wanted that weekly thing. And so sure. what we did is we set it up where you know when you subscribe, you basically get kind of weekly orders that are up to you based on you can set it in advance, you can, and we also recommend things to you based on your preferences. Um, but I think two things I call out that I think are, are pretty special with this. Well, one is more that when people hear subscription, they're like, Oh, is there some weekly monthly fee? There isn't. It's just pay as you go. It's really kind of an ordering mechanism and a reminder mechanism. Um, we call it a concierge service, actually. Um, oh, I like that. Yeah, someone to someone to remind me, hey Tim, you're gonna get hungry. You're gonna, this thing you ate tonight. You're gonna want it again in two weeks. Yeah. And we're gonna set. I'm like, th at the end of the day, that's ultimately personally why I, I so oftentimes turn to an app. It's because I didn't plan ahead. So right, to have right. a concierge who can yeah, yeah, be so thoughtful as to remind me about that <laughs> bacon oh, cheeseburger I'm gonna make. The other thing I would say is like, you know, we want to make it as easy as possible, meaning that you change your plans, you cancel right, you know, a day before, um, you can order just one per week, a lot of these meal kit companies, you have to order, you know, seven meals per week and cancel seven days in advance. And it's just not didn't work for me. And I didn't work for a lot of people. So I think there's that flexibility that a lot of people appreciate. Really modern SaaS approach to Obviously, uh, uh, a space yeah. that we can all appreciate. Something I didn't ask that I meant to, and I'm curious mm -hmm. if, if you have any any details, insight that you can share, the impact to the restaurants. Obviously, it makes sense, and we talked about it. It's all very logical that it's this is mm -hmm. good for everyone. Do you have any like cool stories? Hey, they increased their bottom line this much, or do you have any exciting case stories of the restaurants you've worked with? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's that obvious aspect from a revenue standpoint, I would say several things that we get excited about. I think just going back to the core model that we have is we've created a process for them that is so easy and not disruptive to their operations, where it's it's the kind of joining us is, is extremely easy. Because if you think about their daily process, they just get orders, they prep more ingredients than they're already prepping during the day. 
and then they put it in packaging that we provide and then we ship it. Right. So cool. there's really no work on their front. And I think they get really excited about that. Um, I think another benefit that they're seeing is that we can deliver farther. Um, right. So oh, DoorDash, extended reach for exactly. the restaurant. Yeah. Like where DoorDash and Uber Eats, because there's a time decay, as soon as you order, it's like, oh, I need to get it hot and fresh. Um, because of our delivery system and the fact that, you know, we have insulated packaging, et cetera, and it's order ahead, we can help restaurants that are in Lower East Side deliver to Upper West Side, right? Where it's, and so they like that access. Um, I think another thing that Mark, uh, what we've found is restaurants really like is it's a really great marketing tool because if you get influencers cooking it at home, it's like such a great content wow, wow. generator. It's like, oh my God, I'm cooking this at home. <laughs> So they love that marketing aspect um, that, you know, we've we've kind of provided to them. So a lot of, I would say, ancillary benefits that have we've discovered through this process that um, has made kind of the, the value pop pretty strong for restaurants. I'm subscribed. I'm looking forward to what comes next, seeing how the company continues to grow. It's exciting. I, new concept. Is there anybody else doing anything similar like in any other city around the world that you know of? Um, there are some, I mean, actually during the pandemic in New York, I would say four or five of these companies popped up. Um, what happened? None of them are around anymore. Um, they just didn't make it. They didn't make it. And I think the, I, I mean, I, I'm biased again, but I think what, what we realized right away is like, we have to do it the hard way for it to work. Meaning that we have to own our own delivery network. Cause that's the only way they get costs down. Right. If other people are uh, outsourcing or doing USPS, you just, you mm -hmm. just can't do it in the right way. Um, we realized that you had to standardize the recipes. You had to standardize two servings per kit, like, because you can't order one that's like 10 servings and there's a shitty recipe or sorry, sorry for my French, but, um, it's, it's okay. We're stuff. not, we're not, I don't think we're <laughs> okay. anywhere that we're going to get censored. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll even go back and add a bleep. I don't know that I've ever added a bleep before we could do that. That's a first. <laughs> I'm usually the one drops an F bomb. You're good. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think there, you, you have to be thoughtful about it to, to, to get it. Um, there's some other ones that are tangentially similar, but nothing really like us. Awesome. Again, Robert, we'll link to all of the uh, information and links that you provided us with before. Can't thank you enough for, for having been here and sharing as much as you have. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, man. It's, uh, it's been a blast. Definitely. We'll do it again. Uh, we'll, we'll Maybe we'll book the next one now. We'll book it in advance. <laughs> perfect, perfect. If you found this to be helpful, please share it with somebody who could benefit. As always, make sure to smash that subscribe button and leave the podcast a review wherever you're listening. That's how you help us grow. We'll see y'all next time. It might take a lifetime to know just who you are. Quarter century, I finally came to my senses. I finally got my hand up on the tinted Benz kid. I see the world clear through my tinted lenses. With the dream and the drive, the possibilities endless. Now print that, send this all the way to Tokyo. Take a trip down south, down to Mexico. Next stop, Shanghai, the world class trade show. First class all the way, cause that's how we roll. Yeah, call us the rock star businessman. Rocking shows we handle business, man. We got our own future in the palm of our hands. Cause divided we fall and together we stand.